for me, the sticking points were when we started writing songs. Nine out of 10 ideas that Mick showed me, he was playing keyboard. And they were mid-tempo, somewhat rock songs, not, not heavy or anything. They were, they, were, they were nice. They were good songs, and the music was nice. But, but it wasn't dynamic in any stretch of the imagination the way 4 and 4 was. And then, then there was I Want to Know What Love Is. And he and I, he played me the idea for that song, and I liked it. And I was not a ballad guy, but that's, that song was very special. And we worked on that song. He, he, he had a house in Bedford Hills, which was about 20 minutes from my house in Katona. So I was over his house at least five out of seven nights a week, having dinner and working till one or two in the morning with him on that song specifically. And we would just hit creative dead ends, walk away from it frustrated, kept plugging away. And we ended up getting the body of the song correct and the, the the chorus lyrics and melody the way we wanted it and uh we were set to go in and record it mick had a friend who, who who he knew from from years ago he heard the song and and told mick that he had been working for a gospel label the past few years and he says i know what the song needs he says it needs a gospel choir in the choruses and, and Mick kind of was taken aback and he thought about it and he goes, you could be right. He says, and I, and, and the, his friend says, I have just the, the choir for you. It's New Jersey mass choir. He says, they've had hits on their own in the gospel charts on the day that they came down to, to sing the choruses. I was in one studio next door to where they were just myself and an engineer I was singing the lead vocal to the song, which hadn't been done yet. Mick was consumed with the choir and making sure that that they sounded the way they should. And I was in the next studio over singing the lead vocal. Usually when I would sing the lead vocal, Mick w wouldn't be more than three feet away from me, offering suggestions, little criticisms, and, and making sure it came out the way he wanted it. I didn't, when I walked in there to sing that lead vocal, I didn't see him for four hours. And when I saw him, I handed him the tape and I said, I'm done. And he looked at me like, what do you mean you're done? I haven't even heard it yet. He didn't say that. But, but then with the, with the gospel choir there in front of the mics, he played my version with my lead vocals on it and my vocals on, on the chorus too. And the choir sang along with, with the choruses. I, I got goosebumps and chills all over my body. And I looked over at Mick and he was crying. So you guys so, knew that you had it. Yep, we had it. And, and uh, so, so when we were recording that album, at the end of completion of every song, Mick and I would sit down at a, at a table. And on a little piece of paper, we would write out what we thought the split was for the song between the two of us as writers, you know? And, and we'd done that from album one. So like Hot Blooded was 50-50. Uh, Double Vision was 60 for Mick, 40 for me. Uh, um, you know, and other songs had different, different splits. And, and I wrote 60 for Mick, 40 for me. And I slid that piece of paper over to him and he slid one over to me. So, so I saw him look at my piece of paper and, and, and he, he didn't smile or anything. He had stone face on him. And I picked up my piece of paper. You know what he had on it? 95, five for him. We had worked on that song since it was just a little tiny idea for weeks and weeks and weeks until it became a song. Wow. I was involved in the melody in, in the, 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 um, the, the 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 arrangement of the song and, and plus I sang the ad libs and I sang the hell out of the song and, and his best offer was 95 five and 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 I knew I knew right away why I was insulted I was angry and I knew right away why it was because he knew that song was going to be number one and he wanted it all for himself but he would sacrifice 5%. I tore the piece of paper up and I says, 
Nick, I know why you're doing this. I says, you want the song for yourself. So it just says Jones under writers. I says, you do that. I says, I said, I don't want any part of it. So he did. Song went to number one. The song itself sold millions, millions and millions of songs. I think it went two and a half times platinum just for the single. It was immediately re-recorded by, by, by uh, Winona Judd, an Australian singer, re-recorded it and, and had had a worldwide hit with it. So it was it was a number one hit for three other artists. He made millions and millions of dollars off of just that song. I didn't see a nickel. How do you think that affected us the nope. next time we were going to do an album? The next album was what? Inside information. There we go. <laughs> yes. So after after uh, the 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 album with I want to know what love is w- w- was done and, and that was the only well that was yesterday was it was a hit too but but that's it usually we had we had three or four singles it, it went deep into the album cuts but with him playing keyboards most of the time the fm stations weren't playing the song the songs either you know after the success of i want to know what love is well we we toured to support that album obviously and then after the tour was over he and his wife went on a round the world yacht trip Okay, he was gone about four and a half months. In the time that he was gone, I wrote and recorded my first solo album. Like I said, well, he he and his wife were on their world cruise. I recorded and with Atlantic's permission, because they knew he was gone for a long time to release my first solo album. And I got a spot as special guest for Steve Miller, which was a very good break. His, his audience is a little different than mine. You know, he, he, he's, his music is not as hard and, and as tough, but, but it's still good music. And, and us in the opening s- slot playing, playing Midnight Blue and Ready or Not, and some, of, some of those songs, uh, uh, his audience gleaned right to us. And, and we were getting uh, uh, gr- great uh, um response for them and, and, and it, it was it was awesome being a part of his tour so so apparently when mick finally did get back and found out that i i wrote and recorded a solo album it was not only released but i was on the road promoting it <laughs> he went through the roof he went and chewing out atlantic records people who who were high up on the ladder, had control over his career, so to speak, his recording career. So he's chewing people out that he should just have his mouth shut. And then he finally got around to calling me. He says, you having fun, Lou? He says, uh, is, is, I hope your album's doing good. I haven't heard it. He goes, uh, but we're starting to record our next album, and I need you back here now. I says, Nick, I says, I'm in the middle of it of a tour with Steve Miller promoting my album. Uh, uh, I said, if there's anything that I learned from you was that when you're on the road promoting an album, there should be nothing that discourages you or interrupts that. I says, I'm taking those words as truth. I says, so if you want my help, I says, when the tour's done in another four to five weeks, I said, I'll be glad to come back to New York and start working on the album. How do you take that? Not good. So I finished my 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 tour with Steve Miller. It went fantastic. It it, it was it, it made a lot of good for, for the the album, promoting the album like that. And and um, and when I finally got back to to uh, the studio with Mick and the rest of the guys, the rest of the guys were were hey Lou, heard your album. It's awesome, man. I was going good luck with that. You know, hugging me and, and shaking my hand and stuff. And Nick was, was sulking. The writing on that album didn't go well. I, I barely had anything with any of the songs. Maybe out of 10 songs, maybe three songs, I had a part in writing it. And it got to the point that 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 I, I, I didn't feel in any connection with him uh, uh, creatively. You know, and any any small idea that I put in, he would say he would say, yeah, great. And then ignore it, not use it. So, so I saw the way that was going. So I didn't volunteer anything for any songs anymore. He wrote them all. 
But when it came time for me to sing, he usually, I would, I would usually spend a day and a half on each song. Unnecessarily so, but that's what we did because I would sing it and he would make me go back and do it again, telling me to sing this this way and sing that phrase that way. And I try his ideas and they sucked. They used to be pretty good. I used to take his ideas and, and, and kind of make them mine and they were they were very good. You know, but 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 the stuff that he was suggesting to me really what was maybe maybe his brains fell overboard on that on that uh, <laughs> ocean floor, you know. Because it, it it didn't sound like anything from the mick that I knew. And he was insisting that I I I sing them that way, you know. I was right. out of the creative element of the album and now he wants to tell me how to sing again like he did when i first joined the band 